Um, thank you all for coming this evening. Um, we're going to be looking at Patagonia. And um, our travel guide is going to be Jerry Griswold, who um, has done other uh, programs for us, one about Iceland, one about uh, the Easter Island, which I thought was fabulous. And this one is about her travels in Patagonia. So um, Jerry, really welcome. And thank you again for coming to see us and, and uh, educate us. Nancy, really? thank you so much for having me three times. And I'm, I'm just absolutely thrilled and that you, you know, are indulging me and in showing pictures of traveling because of course I love traveling so much. I love a lot of things so much. I get a bee in my bonnet about something and then off I go. And, uh, you know, for me in life in general, there is nothing that feels better than sharing. And I love sharing. I love sharing pictures, stories. I want to hear your stories. I want to see your pictures. This is something that we um, have in common, uh, the love of travel. Um, I just think that you're, you become a better person through your travels. And it makes you also appreciate your home all, all the more. I, I think it was Charles Dickens that had a quote, something about leaving and then coming back home and appreciating where you live all the more. Um, but boy, do I appreciate this place, this wild place, because Patagonia is a vast place. Um, I've only been to Torres del Paine National Park in southern Chile, but there is northern Patagonia in Chile as well. And then there's the Argentine side, and I've never been there. So I've never been to northern Patagonia in Chile. I've never been to the Argentine side. Um, the Chileans and the Argentines um, are civil to each other. They normally wouldn't like each other very much, but they're civil to each other because a Chilean once said, we have to be because we share Patagonia. <laughs> that they'd probably be fighting like cats and dogs. Why did I choose this area and not the uh, Argentine side is because I'm kind of a snob and um, I wanna go to places that are more difficult to get to in the hopes that I'm going to be able to experience the place alone and or just with the people that live there. And it is more difficult to get to the Chilean side of Patagonia than it is to get to the Argentine side. And that's why I chose it. But I also chose it for the Paine Massif, the mountain range there, which I believe is one of the most beautiful things you will ever see in, in your life. Um, when you see some of these pictures of, of the Cuernos del Paine, the horns of blue, you will understand what I mean, how absolutely gloriously seductive and it's, it's almost unreal. It's pinched me. I cannot believe that I've been given the opportunity to experience this place. It's wild, it's beautiful, it's windy, and I hope you enjoy the presentation. Nowhere is a place. Um, I stole the name actually, Nowhere is a Place by a book by Paul Thoreau and um, with passages by Bruce Chatwin. And if you are lovers of, of literature, um, read Bruce Chatwin's book in Patagonia and pick up Paul Thoreau's book, Nowhere is a Place. It's, it's through these books that I absolutely fell in love with this part of the world and, and had to see it. So Patagonia is a region uh, encompassing the vast southernmost tip of South America. It's shared by Argentina and Chile and the Andes Mountain is the dividing line. And that is what makes the Chilean side so difficult to get to. Uh, so in order to get here, you would fly into Santiago, um, the capital of, of Chile, which is a lovely city, population about 5 million. Uh, they call it Pacifico. It's a very peaceful city and it really is. And it has a very European flair to it. Much of the architecture, in fact, there's even a train station there that is designed by Gustav Eiffel, Eiffel Tower. And, um, and of course, I've never been to Buenos Aires, but I know that Buenos Aires also has a very European feel to it. Santiago is no different. All flights into Chile land in Santiago, and then off you go to Easter Island or to the uh, Puerto Mott and the northern portion of Patagonia or to Torres del Paine, or to Punta Arenas um, at the very southernmost tip of, of Chile. So the Argentine side is arid, arid steppes, grasslands, deserts, but they also have mount, big mountains like Fitzroy, um, and they have glaciers as well. But the Chilean side is glacial fjords and temperate rainforests. So, you know, this is a, this is a place that is, it's huge, 403,000 square miles and a population of 2 million. Little Connecticut, I had a little, let me see if I can find this piece of paper. Let me see if I can find this very quickly, yeah. 
Connecticut, okay, so, oh, I'm so happy I found this. I can't find anything normally. 403,000 square miles for Patagonia. Connecticut is 5,543 square miles. And our population in Connecticut in 2020, 3,605,944. Population in all of Patagonia, 2 million. So five people per square mile. That's why I go there. It's just so empty and beautiful. And boy, can you immerse yourself in nature. I'm so excited I found that piece of paper. Uh, the income in the West is in the East is sheep farming, oil and gas. And that's in the Argentine side and in Chile, uh, it is fishing, tourism, uh, and salmon aquaculture. Uh, Chile is the second largest exporter of salmon in the world, uh, next to Norway. So that's something that's, the food is unbelievable. And of course, a lot of agriculture um, in Chile, the, you will, if you were a vegetarian or a vegan, you will never be at a loss for something to eat. Um, but if you are a carnivore, or, an, or you know an omnivore, you're going to find a lot of great meats as well. Their lamb is unparalleled, and the salmon is outrageously good. So the temperatures, remember, we're south of the equator. So the springtime there is September to November, 36 to 64. I totally did use temperatures. Summer, December to February, 41 to 72. In the autumn, which is March to May, and I've been there in April, and I've been there in November. March to May, 32 to 50, and their winter time is June and August to August, 28 degrees to 43 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperatures and the climatic conditions really vary between the different regions of Patagonia. And at nighttime and altitude, you can see even colder temperatures. Um, but the wind is what is crazy down here. And it's, it is amazing because I found so many similarities between this part of the world and Iceland except that everything down here is supersized and everything in Iceland is miniaturized. <clears throat> but the wind is crazy. Um, in Iceland, the wind will cut through your clothes and cut you to the bone. This is just obnoxious high winds that aren't cold, but they will knock even a big girl like myself down to the ground. Crazy, crazy windy. Um, so it, 30 degrees Fahrenheit cooler if you really get a wind kicking in. And just another picture of it. Um, Tierra del Fuego, as you can see, is shared by both Chile and uh, Argentina. And Tierra del Fuego is nothing but a large, it is an island, a very big island. We'll talk about how that comes into play with the European explorers that have come to this area of the world. Because I'm not just painting you a pretty picture of this, I'm going to tell you the dark side of this, just as I did with Easter Island, the dark side of what happened there as well. And Chile is just, it has everything. I think it's the longest, thinnest country in the world. It just encompasses so much of South America, but it's very, very narrow. It is the home to the driest desert in the world, the Atacama, um, and then you get all the way down to Patagonia. It has ring of fire, so it has earthquakes and volcanoes, and then you get down to Patagonia and there's none of that. You'll have no altitude adjustment when you go here. Um, the mountains are high, but you are pretty much at sea level. So you get, and the time difference is nothing. They're either the same as us or an hour behind or an hour ahead, but you won't have major jet lag when you go here. So it's just like tick off all the boxes. It's just, it's just really great. So in 1520, Magellan um, was sailing around and landed in this area of the world. And he wasn't too impressed. He couldn't find a place to park his boat. And he, of course, discovered the Straits of Magellan. And that, and that is, you know, really important because nobody wanted to travel around the end of South America. It's hideously dangerous, even for big cruise ships. People get sick all the time. So, um, but Magellan decided uh, that he found a place where he could cut through and avoid the, um, the Cape. And it was on the when I don't want to mess this up. Was he on the south or north? He was on the northern portion of Tierra del Fuego. So he found the Straits of Magellan. But he didn't spend much time here. He kind of got off the boat and he saw these huge people, huge people. He called them Patagons because of their huge size. Well, actually, 
the native people of this area were no more than about six feet tall. But that was fairly tall compared to you know, European standards. And he was like, well, this is probably cool. They probably have some European cooties there. And then off they went. There were many different, I guess, tribes of people or sects of, sex of people uh, that lived here. And most of them were nomadic. And some of them traveled around by foot. Some of them traveled around by boat because you can see there are lots of islands um, in fjords in this area. But they were very peace-loving people. They didn't fight amongst each other. There was an abundance of food, whether it was fishing, whether it was just foraging, um, whether it was the, the wildlife like Quanacos, the camelids that lived there. Everybody seemed to get along just fine and dandy. So Magellan is like, nah, they're tall people here. Oh, this is a really funny picture. So that's not funny. That's a really cool map. Oh, yeah, I put this one in my last presentation showing you the Straits of Magellan and then the Beagle Channel, which is south of that. So this is a picture of the Straits of Magellan. So un until the Panama Canal was finished in 1914, the only way to cut through and avoid going through the Cape was through the Straits of Mag Magellan. Um, it was the only safe way to move between the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. And uh, the southern portion of Tierra del Fuego was much more forgiving in terms of being able to park a boat and go up on this big island and to, to explore. This is a funny picture. This is how the Europeans saw the native people of Patagonia, these giants, the Patagons, which another translation is big feet. So really Magellan made no impact. He found this really nifty way of avoiding, uh, you know, this really rough water. And then these two guys came along. It was in, I think, 1833. Uh, the man on the left is Robert Fitzroy and the man on the right is Charles Darwin. And Fitzroy, of course, has a major um, mountain named after him in uh, the Argentine side of Patagonia called Fitzroy. And Charles Darwin was on a boat that Fitzroy was on called the Beagle, and they found the Beagle Channel. And the Beagle Channel was the southern um, portion of Tierra del Fuego. There's where they could stop their boats. There's where they could go up on land and just chart their things and meet people. And, um, and they were fascinated by it. They didn't spend a lot of time because they were too busy you know, being cartographers and charting uh, the oceans and the lands. Um, but they were pretty fascinated by the people of, of Tierra del Fuego. And we'll talk about them in a minute. This is an actual painting um, in the Beagle Channel by the ship's artist. It was painted uh, in the, around 1834 or so. And the channel, the Beagle Channel, of course, was named after the HMS Beagle. Let's see what the notes I have written here that I can remember. Yeah, so it was just doing a big survey of the oceans and the lands. But one of the things that these guys came across because they could go up onto the land. Oh, this, oh, there was a quote that Darwin made, which is so wonderful. Um, when they reached the channel on January, 1833, Darwin wrote in his field notebook, it is scarcely possible in, to imagine anything more beautiful than the barrel like blue of these glaciers and especially as contrasted with the dead white of the upper expanse of snow. So pretty. But then they found these people, the Selknam. And this tribe, I went down a big rabbit hole studying these people. Uh, they only lived on Tierra del Fuego. They were unbelievably sophisticated. These are some of their um, ceremonial paint, body paintings and costumes that they would wear. And they were peaceful and had a very complex society, a very sophisticated society. They didn't grow anything because there was such an abundance of vegetation there that they could forage. And of course they were surrounded by water. So there was fish. And then they also had birds to eat and Juanaco. And Darwin and Fitzroy just were enamored of these people. And they borrowed a couple of them and they brought them back to London. And I really need to do more research on this, but one of the, one of the Selknam, I think, died on the voyage. Maybe there are three that they, they borrowed. And one of them became the darling of British society. 
And that's when all of a sudden, everybody started looking at this part of the world and saying, oh, oh gee, that land down there kind of looks like Wales, Ireland, Scotland. Maybe we can go down there and bring our sheep. And maybe we can put up fences and farms. And, and all of a sudden, these poor Selkham, all of a sudden there are fences around their property. And then the worst thing could possibly happen. This Romanian immigrant, Julius Popper, decided to move there and find a better life. He was an interesting fellow, um, a terrible man, uh, who was actually, uh, he was an engineer and he laid out part of the city plan for Havana, Cuba. So he was a super smart guy. So he kind of, in a Napoleonic sort of way, anointed himself, da, 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 the governor of Tierra del Fuego. He found gold, which is always a bad thing. He found gold in the rivers there. He minted his own coins. He made his own postage stamp and he started killing all the native people. He put a bounty on the head of every man, woman, and child. And they would, people would be given up to one pound. Can you imagine how much money that was back then for the scalps or the hands or the ears or the heads of the native people? These poor people didn't have a chance. And they, what they did also was they poisoned um, food and they put it on the uh, shores. They would poison whales. And then the people, of course, and sell them, would eat them, and then they would all die. The picture down at the bottom, and this is modern times, the days of photography, there is a Native person dead there, and they're on a bounty hunt. And they wiped every, I could cry every single time I tell this story, because th these are the most beautiful people. There, I have this incredible book that um, I still haven't unpacked yet. I would have brought it tonight. All photography of the Selknam taken by, um, I believe it was a, a priest, a, a missionary of some sort that lived with them for a while. And they were just the most beautiful people. And this evil man annihilated all of them. And that was the end of those people. There isn't one full-blooded native person left in this area of the world. There are people that have some blood but there are no native people anywhere because the Europeans come and of course they bring all their cooties in as well. But you know, that's the, that is the dark side of this absolutely extraordinary place. And um, I just feel a need not to just show you pretty pictures, but also to tell you the dark truth about what, what happened when we arrived. So there you have it. Let's talk about pretty things. The tattered Chilean flag, for one, because of the Patagonian winds, always, you would think that they're starched that way, but the wind, their flags are always flying that way. I think this is a Photoshop picture, but uh, just as we have a um, national flag and we have a state flag, the flag in front of the Chilean flag is uh, for Magellanus. This is for this area of Chile. And in the background, my favorite mountain range, the Cuernos del Paine. Of course, the National Park is named after the Taurus, the Pine, the Towers of Blue, which we will talk about. Uh, but first, before we get into the park, we need to go visit penguins because penguins are only seen in the Southern Hemisphere, South Africa, and this part of the world as well. And there are these lovely little penguins and you can go to a national park and sit in a blind and watch them be penguins and just be in awe of them. So before we headed off to Taurus, del Pine, we took a little trip to a beautiful national park near Punta Arenas and watched penguins for a little while. It was just a gorgeous, gorgeous day, windy, but very much um, reminiscent of the weather that I was experiencing in Iceland all the time. And they were just really sweet guys. So you will see a lot of birds, um, a lot of different birds of prey, including the largest vulture, uh, largest vulture in the world, the Indian condor lives in this area and you will see them as elusive as they are, uh, you will see them. This is not one of them, but it's some sort of hairy or some sort. Uh, and again, if you were somebody that's been to Ireland or you've been to Scotland or you've been to Iceland, you'll look at this picture and think, this is exactly what I'm seeing. Very, very similar. 
even culturally, it's a sheep culture, so is Iceland. It's a horse culture, so is Iceland. Um, it's a fishing culture, so is Iceland. Beautiful waving grass and some lucky guy with uh, these penguins. Obviously, they don't, um, well, it's not obvious. Uh, things like the emperor penguins will lay their eggs on rocks, but these guys burrow almost like puffins do. So this photographer on the stand has a big zoom lens and he's getting some, this is breeding season, and um, he's getting some really great pictures of the penguins in their, in their tunnels. Big sky, everything about this area of the world is big. And also something else that uh, echoes Iceland is the fact that the wind is so intense that a lot of their homes are sited in metal, corrugated metal. And this is an old farmhouse where we had a wonderful barbecue covered in metal. Just the remains of an old train there. But we were invited to this barbecue. What they do is they'll take a lamb and they butterfly it and then burn some wood and make this big metal crucifix really uh, for it. And they, they strap it onto that and all the fat drips off. And my God, you have never, ever, ever. It needs nothing. You don't need a sauce. I mean, you could sprinkle some balsamic vinegar on it. That would be really nice. A little kosher salt, maybe my house is watering. I mean, I already had dinner, but, but it's so absolutely delicious. So this was our din din. And alongside this would be served sometimes empanadas, stuffed with corn and cheese, um, grilled salmon, and an abundance of fruits and vegetables, a lot of avocados, a lot of tomatoes, a lot of uh, just so many fruits and vegetables all grown in Chile. The sheep barn, and they allowed us in, which was really nice. And obviously they do a lot with wool uh, in this area of the world as well. And obviously this was also after a slaughter, but you know, you learn everything. I, I want to know everything when I travel to a place. I want to know the people. I want to know what they do. I want to know how they work. I want, I want to see it all. More tattered flags. But here we are now entering the Parque Nacional Torres del Paine. Um, so it's a nine hour flight to Santiago, about a four hour flight to Punta Arenas, and about a four hour drive to get into the park. It's about the destination, not the journey, Nancy. Just sit back and enjoy it. And when you get there, you'll forget that it took a million days to get there. Everybody that's living in the park now is somebody that's been there forever. You can't just build there anymore. It's it's protected area. You can't take things out of it. You can't pick up rocks and bits and bobs of stuff and take them home. They'll find it in your bag. And um, any farmer that's there is either going to pass that farm down or I don't know, maybe some other farmer will take it over, but no new farms are being built. So it's a, a very typical farmhouse in, in Patagonia, Torres del Paine. And you will see camelids. You will understand when you travel here that this is a place that was once attached to Africa. Pangea was its name when Africa and South America were um, stuck together. Uh, the African continent has the dromedary um, camel, and this area of the world has the huanaco, the llama, the vicuña. They're all related. They have a small type of ostrich called a rea in this park, and you'll see them during the, the program. So their uh, animals are very, very similar, and it's all just something that occurred, and then the continent split, and they all ended up uh, di diverging and, and doing their own thing and having their own adaptations. Um, here we are taking our first hike, and um, that little, little, it's actually a huge lake in the background is called Sarmiento, and there is a tiny little white line that you can see on the shore across the lake, and it is a very unusual lake because it's filled with all of these strange rock formations. I'm not a geologist, Nancy, I can't even remember what the name of the rock is called. But this lake is only filled by melting snow and rain. So it doesn't have a river source going into it. And it has these strange rock formations. Well, how strange are they? They're like this. It's almost like calcified rock. If there are anybody, anybody in the audience tonight that knows uh, geology, you can set me straight on it. But it is just absolutely 
stunning and unusual, and you won't see anything else like it in the entire park. Also, the clouds, because of the high winds, these are called lenticular clouds, and it looks like a giant spaceship. And these things are way up in the atmosphere, and the wind is whipping around them and keeping them literally in place. So this cloud was with us for a couple of hours, as opposed to clouds just like shooting off into the wherever clouds go. This guy is hanging around with you like a giant zeppelin over you. There it is again in the back. And here we are on the shores of Sarmiento. Very unusual place. I love this because it shows so many textures of the shore, but way in the background are the Cuernos del Paine. That is basalt and granite, all carved by glaciers, about 9,000 feet high. So we were walking out to this rocky outcrop it looks like the Huanaco is leading us there. And you can get very close to these animals. You wouldn't get too close because they'd kick you or spit at you, but they're very accustomed to you. You are not a puma, so they're comfortable around you. But on that rocky outcrop, which looks a lot smaller than it is, were Andean condors that were breeding and we got to see them. And that was really cool. And I love the people that travel with me because they're always very curious. They're always looking on the ground at plant material or the tiny little, those, those little things that make that big picture. Um, very, very thoughtful travelers. And this guy was just, I wasn't using a Zoom. He was just standing there and posed for me and it was just lovely. They said that there are only about 4,000 Juanaco in the park. And I swear to God, by the time you're done with the trip, you think you've seen them all. So how do those gauchos get their energy? They get it by drinking this high octane tea called mate. Um, and that is uh, my friend Ricardo's hand. He was our guide. We became very good friends. And I actually brought him to Iceland on one of my tours. Um, and I'm bringing two Icelanders to Patagonia next year, doing a cultural exchange. And Ricardo is holding a, a cup that his grandfather gave him. So I think it's zinc and it has leather outside. And that little spoon in there is called a bombilla. And it's really like a tea infuser. It's like a straw and it has holes in the bowl. And what you'll do is just put that in there. You, you put your mate in the cup, you pour hot water in, you put your bombilla in and you just sip out of that little um, spoon it strains all of the mate out and it's very, very high caffeine and it keeps those gauchos running all the time. No tocar, do not touch. Ricardo was taking us out to see petroglyphs and it amazes me, and these are about 2000 years old, that that's the only sign that presents, that, that prevents you from touching one of these beautiful native paintings. Uh, here, everything would be roped off and cordoned off, and or maybe you wouldn't even know about it, uh, but they trust that you're going to be respectful. Animals and handprints. Or people and animals. I love also the nubby rock. This is a conglomerate rock, and these are created, it almost looks like it's cement with a bunch of rocks just pushed into it. This is what happens when glaciers are rolling. There's a great glacier is a big moving object and it rolls over land and it just rolls all, all the dirt and all the rock together and forms this really nubby conglomerate rock. My big scientific, um, you know, geological uh, explanation for you. And sometimes they look like truffles, big boulders of conglomerate rocks just dropped there. It's also very difficult to give you an idea of how huge this place is, how there are actually Juanaco down below there that you can't even see. They're like tiny little ants. It's just a, a very, very big place. It's, you know, and if you're somebody that's not even a hiker, there are still wonderful things for you to see. If you're a really experienced hiker, there are a lot of things for you to see. If you are a medium hiker, that too, and even if you're a novice, 
um, you, you will find plenty to do in this area. You don't necessarily have to be a big outdoors person. Because of all of the European visitors here, a lot of the lakes are named European names. So in the far left is Nordenskjold, the Nordic Lake. A Patagonian goose. It's always easy to remember the names of animals because it's usually Patagonian skunk, Patagonian owl. <laughs> Very easy to remember as a Patagonian goose. And occasionally you will find the remains of Wanako. And when you do, especially in a situation like this, it's because it's been preyed upon by a puma. Pumas are extremely elusive. And you're looking at this landscape and you're saying, where could they possibly be hiding? But because of their coloration and how still they are, they blend in nicely into the landscape. And so they can just creep up and pounce and off you go into Wanako heaven. Lots of pops of color in the springtime, a lot of little flowers and nothing grows tall because of the wind, just like in Iceland. Lots of little orchid species, tiny little things that all live very close to the ground. But it just gives the landscape that beautiful little pop of color. So the Pine Massif, the very tail end of the Andes. So the name of the park is Torres del Pine, named after the three towers of blue. The the Torres del Paine are the Towers of Blue. Paine is the, um, I think the tribe was the Telfuelches. Uh, their word for blue was Paine. And a lot of times people go to this area only for a couple of days. And these mountains are very elusive. They're many, many times more often than not covered in clouds. Um, and people just check it off their list, been to Patagonia, been there, done that. But my groups have been there for 10 days. And that's when you really get to know the people. But of course, there's a better chance you're going to see these mountains. They're about 10,000 feet. They were scaled for the first time, I believe in the 1940s possibly, which is pretty incredible considering that mountaineering people had already been to Everest and yet these things hadn't been scaled. And it's just massive. It's again, so difficult to envision how big they are in just a photograph. You can kind of get an idea when you see that road down below. It, they just consume the landscape. But this is what I think is crazy. This is pe people climb, yes. So if you're one of the experienced hikers, you are going to end up at the base of these towers you're going to be right near that little lake and you can actually see a footpath to the right. But here is a guy and I, I go down a rabbit hole when I study for these presentations. This is one of the trails up one of the towers. When you look at a mountaineering magazine, they have all of these lines drawn on. Oh, you can do the B path or you could do the C path. Can you imagine? Look at that thing. It's sheer. It's granite. It just, <laughs> it's just unbelievable. I snitched off the internet and I don't care. I'm safer down on the ground looking at them and admiring them from afar. <laughs> I like this, it's kind of like a drive through restaurant. I was having, I was at a barbecue in this hut and this horse came by and it looked like a Patagonian McDonald's drive through. Fires happen down here and they're very, very strict about where people camp. But a lot of times people don't heed that, um, that uh, advice and they set up camp in places they shouldn't and they start a campfire. And uh, the last one, I actually saw this place with foliage on it in 2007 when I came back in 2014. 
it had burned down um, to the ground and it was a very bad fire. All the fires there are bad because there's no fire department. It's not like they can fly helicopters and extinguish it. They just have to let these things go and, and go through their course and then hopefully die out. If there's a building in the way or somebody's home in the way, they'll do their best to protect it. But for the most part, you just have to let it go. So this was a fire that was started by somebody that was in camping in a place they shouldn't be. And they had some toilet paper and they thought they'd be kind and burn it after they used it. And it started this fire that just burned thousands and thousands of acres. Um, and they caught the guy and I think he was fined some minimal thing and amount of money and deported. But uh, this shows you the extent where the red is of how where that fire burned. And these are some of the places that you know, we will be you know, seeing to Lago Peoe. Uh, I was staying at a hotel in 2007 right on Lago Peoe that was almost taken out in this fire. And there is, uh, is uh, Norden Stold and Sarmiento is over there on the, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but Sarmiento is right here. Devastating. These winds are just crazy. So, so this is beautiful Lago Peoe. The color blue comes from all of the runoff, the mineral runoff from the glaciers. And yes, the glaciers are receding there as well. Of course they are. <clears throat> but the Heliosur is the third largest ice cap in the world. After Greenland, after Antarctica, excuse me, Antarctica, the largest, Greenland, the second largest, and the Heliosur over the Andes that spills down into Patagonia, that's the third largest ice cap in the world. So the two buildings you're seeing, that white, that little white horizontal piece, that is the hotel where I stayed at in 2007, Explora. And then there's another hotel on the left, and both of these hotels nearly disappeared in this last fire. So here we are taking this beautiful walk to see my friends, the Cuernos del Paine, amidst all of these burned trees. And it still makes for some pretty beautiful photography. It was an extremely windy day. And the guides will always get a report in the morning about wind conditions. Sometimes they won't even let you ride horses. It can be so windy, they could knock horses down. But uh, Roberto got the, the green light that we could go out this day and we did. And it ended up that they had given him bad information. And we were walking into a major windstorm. Beautiful sunny day with probably 80 mile per hour sustained winds. You can see the white caps on the lakes and these lakes are big. And that as well. People were getting knocked down. But we were loving it. I don't know if these trees will ever grow back again. Um, chances are they won't. It's such an inhospitable climate for growing trees. Just like Iceland, it was clear cut. And once things are gone, there's more erosion than anything. It's funny, it's almost as though the wind is bending the, the trees and it looks like it's bending the mountain range as well, as well as the people. And yes, here we have uh, glaciers, many glaciers in this area that you can hike to. The French glacier is very famous. Um, this is Lago Gray and the Great Gray Glacier. In order, this is crazy. In order to get out here, you have to walk a little bit. Um, six people on this little bridge. You have to walk through this beautiful forest to a beach. And you see wonderful things like these eerie kind of wizard of Ozian trees. And then you, look, come on, is that real? And then you go to this beach and there are icebergs floating around and the Pine Massif is in the background and it looks like somebody just painted it there. And then you get on a little Zodiac boat and then they bring you out to the boat because it's such, the, the lake is so rough. Bring your drama, mean. The lake is so rough that they can't bring it right to shore, the boat right to shore. 
So you take a Zodiac to the boat and off you go to visit the glacier, which is receding. But you can get very close to it in the boat and it's just lovely. A friend of mine got terribly seasick on this boat ride. Never in your wildest dreams did you think you'd get sick on this, but it's, it was like being on the ocean. Again, nice to be on shore and take all the pictures of the icebergs you want and not get sick. Again, no volcanic activity down here, no earthquake activity here at all. And of course, wherever there are glaciers, there are waterfalls and Patagonia has an abundance of them. And with waterfalls comes rainbows as well. So you're always going to have a rainbow. You're always going to have beautiful, pure water. Lots of dramatic, dramatic water. In my next trip, which is April of 2022, it's been canceled twice because of COVID. Um, I'm bringing a geologist next time. So he can interpret everything that's happening or has happened and will happen. <clears throat> this is the river Salto Chico spilling into the Lago Peoe. Of course, we're all interested in plants and animals, and I'm not very good with plants, so I'm, I'll show you a few things and try my best to explain, and then animals I'm a little bit better. But wherever, I love lichens, and wherever you see a, an abundance of lichens means that the air and the water, the rainwater is very pure. And I've never seen, except in Iceland, so many different colors in lichens, purples and greens and blues and oranges, and just absolutely beautiful. You'll see a lot of these in this presentation. This is a crested cara cara. Uh, it's like a, a buzzard, um, about the size of our turkey vulture. And you'll see a lot of them. My friend Susan having a moment with one. We were having a picnic at a camp and people were obviously throwing food to these animals. So you got up close to them because they were accustomed to being fed. He was a jaunty fellow. But there, as I said, there are all these little orchids these tiny little orchid plants. Um, if you're, you know, a lover of, of orchids, there are lots of them down here. Another species of orchid. Again, tiny, tiny, tiny. Dandelions and this butterfly. How does he even survive that wind? Purple orchids. And the Patagonian fox, it's very similar to our gray fox, except it is, it's got a bulkier body. So it's a, a bit of a bulkier animal, but it's about the same size. Not as big as a coyote, it's just the size of our, our gray fox, if you're familiar with that, um, and much more body than our red fox. Beautiful animal. I have no idea who he is, but it's a nice picture. And uh, there are parasitic um, plants and parasitic, uh, this is just a gall um, and some mushrooms that are taking advantage of that. And that's about the best picture of an Andean condor that I was able to take. Their wingspan is about 11 feet. Um, they're one of the largest wingspans of any bird in the world, and you will get to see them on, on your travels there. It's always a thrill to see them. Huge bird. And there's a rhea. Uh, again, it's a smaller version of the ostrich, but it's big. I'd say a rhea stands about oh, five feet tall. A little bit better picture of one. Flightless, of course. A type of ibis. And of course, always Wanako. Now I didn't take, I, I did take these pictures, but 
I didn't take these, but these are some of the casts of characters, characters that you'll see. There are Chilean flamingos. Um, I saw them in my first trip in 2007, but I didn't see them in 2014. The crested caracara. Cara. Uh, this is a Patagonian meadow lark that looks almost like ours, except it's bright orange. And then the Patagonian woodpecker is very much like our pileated woodpecker. Um, and it does the same sort of damage on trees. It's not damage because they're just eating bugs. As I said, I love the crested caracara so much that I have my 12 times in this presentation. Um, Patagonian swan. There is a closer look at our Andean condor. And there is an owl that is very similar to our great horned owl. It looks more like the Eurasian eagle owl in that it has orange eyes like that bird. Our great horned owl has yellow eyes. And of course, the apex predator is the puma, uh, just like our mountain lion. The Patagonian skunk, adorable. Look at the nose. They even have an armadillo. And then the species of deer, the huemal deer, is extremely rare. I want to say it's an endangered species. Very, very rare to see them. There were a lot more farms in this park before they, I can't remember when they named it a World Heritage Site and they just, in a national park. I love Chile because they're very protective of their land. And in fact, um, it was, I want to say last year that they made just another national park in the northern portion of Patagonia. So CONAF is the name of their National Park Service. Um, and that's when they, they stopped letting people build in this area is when they established this as a national park. But there's still a lot of barbed wire around and sometimes animals get stuck in the barbed wire so they could become prey to pumas, the uh, Huanaco could get stuck in barbed wire. This isn't the case here, but it happens frequently. So I do a lot of studying before I, I travel, but I wasn't expecting this. I didn't realize that they have a wild horse population here. Obviously, the horses were brought in probably by the Spaniards, Europeans, you know, hundreds of years ago, but they're very protective of the herd of horses. And I want to say there, there might be 70 of them left. And a friend of mine that I met because of horses, Pat, he owns it. His name is Peter Morego. Um, Pito, Pito um, asked my group, we were the very first group to come out and help them track wild horses one day. Oh my God. It was the most fun that we were actually helping these guys do research, but we were also drinking all of their alcohol and eating their food. <laughs> we had such fun with these guys. Um, so on the left is my friend, I'm, I am friendly with every single one of these people in the picture today. We're still in touch. Pito is on the right. Enrique is a Spanish um, equestrian, but also a biologist who is back living in Spain again, training horses. And Carolina is a guide who is still a good friend of, of mine as well. Uh, so Carolina was our guide that day and Enrique and Pito were bringing us out to, well, we were hoping we were going to find horses. So we had to do some hiking. It didn't hurt that they were wildly handsome and very charming, um, such, such great people. So all of these people are extremely accomplished equestrians, but then on the other hand, they're also studying the wild horses and protecting them. Here he is drinking out of his mate cup. And Enrique. We had a little horse race. They, they pulled a horse from a gaucho's corral and um, two of the people in my group were very good riders and they all had a race with him uh, to see who rode this horse the best. And I, don't, I think they all won that day. Everybody won a prize. It was nice to see him in action. This is their little survival hut. They just go in there to you know work on the computer or have a lunch or something like that. It was simple, a little foal's hoof. The walls were all covered in burlap. And as we were out hiking, trying to find horses, they're pointing out to us all the flora and explaining 
everything about vegetation and other things about Chile and, and the park. And how do they track horses? Just like we do, we put webcams up. So they have tracking cameras attached to trees. And the horses could be anywhere and we found them. So here are Gail and Ricky doing a count and studying a herd, right? Where is that herd? Where are they? They're down there. We were out all day with them. It was fascinating and fun. And that was the closest we got to the horses. But they know every single one of these animals. Pretty cool. As I was saying, the barbed wire, sometimes the animals can get ensnared in them. And um, this was a mayor. I actually came upon this. Uh, the remains of her and uh, Enrique was familiar with her and sadly she was stuck in barbed wire so they have volunteers come out constantly to try to clear barbed wire so that the wild horses and all the other animals don't get tied up in it and like everything in nature you may not actually see the animal but if you're a good tracker you can see that there was a, a mare here and her little foal and again nature can be cruel but it is what it is As I told you, we just went back there and cleaned them out. Gracias, guys. You were fabulous. As I said, the horse plays a major role in the culture of Patagonia and the people of Patagonia. Um, the place wouldn't exist without them because they do the labor of trucks. They do the labor of trains. They do the labor of everything because you cannot get vehicles into some of these remote places and the horse does it all. So they are coveted and they are loved and they are well cared for. And we get to ride them. That's beautiful Carolina. And I am on top of a horse that is as big as I am. He was about 17 hands named Zapato of the shoe. And he was very kind to let me take my self portrait in his eye. He was just a giant horse. And there I am on my trusty steed. Even I look small on him. They have a horse for every single type of rider. Never ridden on a horse, they've got one for you. My friend Carol had never ridden once and she survived. And then of course, very experienced horses too. This was a windy day, but it was okay um, to be riding. And that's Lago Nor Norden Skilled again. Their tack is very different too. A little bit of leather, a lot of braided rope, and the saddles are wood and leather and um, wool. And he's obviously a working animal. And these are the animals that drag all of the firewood up into the camps way on the, there's a, a trail that goes all over Torres del Paine called the W. And there are huts that hikers will stay in overnight. And these animals bring everything, water, um, siding for the buildings, firewood, every single thing is brought up on horseback. And you get to meet real gauchos. And their saddles. It's so much fun watching these uh, men in action. I didn't see any female gauchos, though Carolina could have been one. She's uh, an incredible equestrian. But um, all of these guys are, it just, they just speak the language of the horse. So everyone knows it's windy, very, very windy, as I've said from the very beginning. And this is one of my favorite pictures of my friend Susan's hair. <laughs> very windy day. She had to sit down and she's a little thing and she would have been blown over. Um, here she is again, thinking that she can stand up and she can't. There are sort of water spouts coming off of the lake and it's crazy wind. Precaution, this is a, a zone of ferocious winds. And you're not kidding, this was a, a, an amazingly windy day. It was dangerous actually. This is the day that Roberto was given the incorrect information. But it's funny, uh, at the end of the day, a woman came up to me in my group and said, this is the best day of my life. Very windy.
they say the least windy time of year to be there is winter, but nothing is open. Um, I would love to go in the in winter. I think it would be really beautiful. There I am. And my little friend NC uh, took a fall, but the guides are always carrying um, kits to fix you up. And she was as tough as nails. Just passed away last year, sadly. She took it like a trooper. Sean gave up and just laid down. It was so windy. On a less windy day, we climbed a beautiful mountain looking down onto a gorgeous glacial river. But the reason I was attracted to this part of the world was because of the Cuernos del Paine. And when I was 40, I, um, I'll be 64 in a, a week or so. When I was 40, I was looking at a New York Times Sunday travel magazine section and they had an article about the Torres del Paine National Park and a big picture of the Cuernos del Paine. And I said, I'm going there when I turn 50. And that's exactly what I did. My friend, Sean and I, my husband wasn't even interested. Sean and I packed our bags. And when I turned 50, we came down here to see these mountains. And the same thing happened with Easter Island. When I, I turned 60, I went to Easter Island. When I turned 70, I think I'm gonna get there before I turn 70, but it's going to be Mongolia. So you know, book me uh, in advance, uh, Nancy. I'll have a Mongolia program for you in a little while. This mountain range is unbelievable. And it, for me, it trumps the Torres del Paine any day. Um, it changes constantly. The cloud cover changes, the light changes, and you could sit in your hotel and drink fine Chilean wine for an entire week and never get sick of this view. They are remarkably beautiful, crafted by glaciers. They're about 9,000 feet tall a top of the salt and followed by the bottom, which is granite. And you've never seen a mountain range like them there. It's just truly one of the most beautiful things. It almost looks volcanic with the clouds uh, formation the way it is. It looks unreal, like somebody just painted it back there, like you're in a Broadway show and somebody just pulled the screen down. My friend Liz turned, uh, we were coming back from a hike to one day and she just turned and looked at it and turned and looked at me and started crying. They are so breathtakingly beautiful and massive. There's a little glacier in there called the French Glacier that you can hike to. Really aggressive hike, I didn't do it. And they change shapes as you drive around the park. I think if it's the only thing that you see when you go here, you would leave a very, very happy person. I did not touch any of the photographs. This is what I saw. I didn't play with any of it. I didn't play with color, texture, light. I didn't touch them. This is all I saw. sunset. And the sunrise. You can rent kayaks as well. Um, for many of the hotels. I don't want you to hate me, but this was my view out my hotel window. <laughs> I decided when I turned 50 that I was going first class and this hotel was super deluxe. And this was the room, the view from our room. I, what can I say? 
I'd like to say that I was doing something wildly adventurous when I took this picture, but I wasn't. I was sitting in a comfortable hotel room, probably with a glass of Sauvignon Blanc in my hand, just going, I cannot believe I'm here. Food and beverages, though, as I said, I'm a big girl. I love food. I had a former career as a chef, and the food is just incredible, and the wines are incredible, and the beers are incredible. Um, you will never be without absolutely delicious food like empanadas and ethereal salmon. I'm very sad to say that this was not a barbecue that I went to, but this is a very typical Patagonian barbecue. Look at all those sausages and roasted peppers and potatoes. Oh my God, sign me up. That's why I'll never be in this part of the world as embedded as I am in Iceland, because I can have these experiences in Iceland, but I want to have them down here. I want to know who he is. I want to be his friend and I want to be at that barbecue. Absolutely beautiful. And of course, Chile produces some of the most affordable and delicious wines in the world. Crazy about them, especially Sauvignon Blancs. They and the New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs are very citrusy. So you have to like a citrusy flavor, but my God, they're so good and very refreshing in the summer and lovely paired, of course, with fish. But anything that you choose um, in Chilean wines, you're going to love. And this is the beer of Patagonia, Austral. Very delicious, like an IPA. Um, and you can, you know, you can um, eat fancy or you can have pizza. Everything they do is good. The hotel I stayed at in 2014 grew all of their own lettuces for their hotels. So there's a lot of organic gardening going on. They're very, very um, uh, environmentally conscious uh, in, in this area. Very protective of what they have. I have no idea. I think it was pork and some lentil -y thing that was absolutely delicious. And some amazing desserty sort of deliciousness. I can't remember. And these are just some of the cast of characters who were so kind to us. Jose on the right doesn't speak a word of English and I still get messages from him on Facebook. He'll send me little songs and um, just to say hello. And they're just, I think next to the Irish, I've never met more beautiful people than the Chileans. So lovely and so friendly. I can't remember the name of the driver in the center there, but Roberto, very good friend of mine now. Carolina, very good friend of mine. I hope to see both of them when I go back next year. And Jose, maybe I'll see. We're not staying at his hotel, but I wouldn't be surprised if we bump into them. The maitre d' at the restaurant was um, Daniel, the man, the second from the left, who is such a character, still friends with him. And of course, if there's a playground, our friends are going to be there. And I would like to say uh, gracias very much. Thank you so much for spending some time with me uh, this evening. Thank you, Betsy. Um, you know, it's not um, a place in the world that I'm an expert about, but I've probably been there two more times than most people have. And to be lucky enough to be looking at my third trip here, um, my friend Ricardo keeps on saying, you've got to come north, you've got to come north because he has a small, his family is a small hotel in Northern Patagonia but I'm not through here yet. I, I can't leave this park until I feel like I've finished everything I need to see. So um, I've got a big group that I'm taking with me in 2022, including two Icelanders, and it kind of make, closes that cultural exchange that I, that I dreamed of doing. Uh, as soon as I stepped foot in Patagonia, I said, this is Iceland, supersized. And when I brought Ricardo to Iceland, a young man in his late 20s who had never left his country and I told him not to study at all before he arrived in Iceland because I wanted to be there for his first impression. He was like, oh my God, this is my country. This is my country. This is my country. This is my country. So I'll be very excited to see what Frederick and Jon have to say when I take them down here uh, next year. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jerry. This my pleasure. This trip really was great. Oh, such beautiful, beautiful landscape. It, it's unreal. It is, it is unreal. When I see this mountain range still, I am in awe. I will be in awe the next time I see it. I, I don't, I, I can't imagine, and I'll never have the time 
the life, the money to go everywhere in the world that I want to see before I die. But I can't imagine there being a more beautiful mountain range than this. It is unreal, absolutely unreal. You've never seen anything like it. Pictures cannot even do it justice. We've got some things on the chat here if you want to take a look at it. Sure, let's see what we got here. Um, let's see, I'm going to stop my share. Thank you so much. Oh, three years in Buenos Aires. I wanted so much to do Patagonia in the 70s. Uh, Marge, you have to go back. Uh, thank you, Betsy. Thank you so much for the kind words. Yeah, I, I hope that my passion for these places spills through my pictures and you know I, my uh, energy, my enthusiasm for these places. Like I said, life is about sharing. And if you never even get here, I hope that I can at least give you a little bit of an entree into this absolutely beautiful place. I came from a very humble beginning, a very poor family, and never in my wildest dreams did I imagine I would ever be able to see this place. But I started my own travel company in 2010, concentrating on Iceland. And I said, yeah, what the heck, let's take a spin at Patagonia. So now I'm, I'm, doing, um, I'm doing both. I'm not here to sell trips tonight. It's just that uh, it was a clever way for me to get to travel. <laughs> and it's and it's worked pretty well so far. I don't know in a in a post pandemic world. I I'm not so sure I want to own a travel company anymore. I, I may give it up, but um, I'll always be doing presentations. I, I just love your idea of traveling. That you want to you want to actually meet people and see how they live. You know, rather than just sort of like it's driving through in a bus <laughs> yeah it's so it's so important and you know and i guess driving through in a bus is fine for some people but i'm a much more curious person and and i've probably said this in every single one of my presentations people define nations you you're not thoroughly in touch with a place until you meet some of its people and uh and i tend to make friends everywhere i go um, and you know these folks that i met uh in Patagonia, um, we're, we're friends to this day, and that trip was in 2014. My first trip was interesting because it was at that fancy hotel, and they kept us away from the riffraff, and that was a bummer. But by the end of the trip, I had managed to infiltrate my way into the dormitories where the <laughs> all the staff were, and we were going swimming. But I didn't get a chance to meet friends. They didn't want you speaking to any of the the staff there. Uh, just, and that stinks. It was a beautiful hotel, mm. but you don't. You want to experience those people. You really want to experience them. I want to know these people. Why? How did you end up here? What's your family like? What you know? What have you? What do they do? Are they all gauchos? Um, do you travel from Punta Arenas to come to work here? Uh, you know, for me, I want to know people's stories. People's mm -hmm. stories are interesting. All people's stories. Everybody has a story. Fabulous. Thank you so much. I also like, Jerry, that you always put in history by getting some resources from books, et cetera, that um, bring it from beginning to, to, the, to the future. It's, it makes it much more cohesive and, um, uh, shall we say, uh, global. Thank you. Thank you so much, Betsy. Yeah, it's, it's important to me that all of these beautiful places have dark pasts, and um, we should never tread in these lands without knowing what happened the backstory how how did that how did how did we get here and where are all these native people does anybody think about that in fact shame on me i didn't really think about including uh, an aspect of native people until i don't know when it was you know what it was i started um i started reading about the sultan and that's when I went down this rabbit hole and it's like, oh my God, I can't just show pretty pictures. I've got to tell the story. And this book that I purchased about the self which is wildly expensive and worth, worth every single penny, really, um, really tugged at me. I mean, I, in talking about Julius Popper tonight, I start crying. I, I just, it is incomprehensible, but it's no different than what happens in many other places of the world, including our own country. Mm -hmm. our, our history is very dark and what we did to the native people and continue to do to them. Mm -hmm. And it's something that we really need to be aware of. So 
I'd love to find Julius Popper is buried in Buenos Aires, apparently. Oh my God. Don't get me even near that guy's grave. I would, they, he died mysteriously. I bet, I bet somebody poisoned him. He had to have been murdered. He must have been the most awful person. I'm sure he ticked off a lot of people. But um, they say he's buried in a cemetery somewhere in Buenos Aires. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions? Any comments? We did see some in the chat I saw. Well, I'm just getting so much love for everybody. That's wonderful, Nancy. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been great. As Thanks. always, thank you very, very thank much. Thank you very much. It's yeah, just a pleasure. So nice working with you and um, so nice doing these presentations for you. And I'll, I'll do my best to drum up some more stuff for you. Great. That would be terrific. Thank you. I think thank you all for coming. Animals. Yeah, I, actually, a series of animals would be terrific. Be um, so thank you all for coming. I really um, I'm pleased that you all were here. And Jerry, I hope to see you again soon. Thank you. You all stay well. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good night, everyone.